Welcome to the Texas Health Harris Methodist Hospital Kidney Transplant Orientation Class. Our objectives are for you to know what each team member can do for you, understand each step in the transplant process, understand your responsibility before, during, and after your kidney transplant, and finally to know what resources are available for transplant patients. We encourage you to jot down any questions so that you may ask them at the end of this presentation. Our team members include the transplant coordinator, department assistant and scheduler, social worker, dietitian, financial coordinator, pharmacist, and living donor patient advocate. The patient advocate will represent a candidate who has applied to be a potential living donor. As required by law, all information about a living donor and their potential recipient is kept strictly confidential. Living donation is the preferred method for transplant as it provides the best recipient outcomes. The kidney transplant evaluation process begins once you sign a consent. This consent form is included in your guidebook. You will work closely with the coordinator to schedule your required blood work and testing. At your phase one visit, you will be evaluated by the transplant social worker, financial coordinator, and dietitian. You will also have your required blood work and testing done at that phase one visit. At your phase two visit, a history and physical is done by the transplant surgeon and transplant kidney doctor. Once all the testing is completed, your case will be presented to our Transplant Acceptance Committee, otherwise known as TAC, or T-A-C. This committee is a multidisciplinary group that evaluates each case and together decides if a candidate is safe to be listed on the national waiting list for a kidney transplant. You will be notified of their decision in writing, as well as given a courtesy call the day of the committee meeting. Once you have been approved to be listed for a kidney transplant, you can be registered on more than one waiting list at different transplant hospitals. You may transfer primary waiting time to your transplant facility of choice, and you may transfer your care to a different transplant hospital without losing accrued waiting time points. It's important to note that in order to be listed at multiple hospitals, you have to undergo each hospital's evaluation process. The most important thing to remember while on the waiting list is that we should be able to reach you 24 hours a day. The call for a transplant organ offer can come in at any time, day or night. While you're on the waiting list, it's important to also keep us notified of changes in your health, insurance, or contact information. The average wait time for a deceased donor kidney transplant is three to four years, you will be required to attend yearly re-evaluations until you receive a transplant. Blood draws for antibody testing will be required for you to remain active on the waiting list. Your coordinator will notify you and your dialysis center when you are due for this testing. Also, it's important to stay healthy and active while you're on the waiting list. The kidney allocation system is the process by which it is determined which candidate will receive a donated kidney. We will now watch a video describing this, these changes. I'd like to talk about the new kidney allocation rules. I know that the rules are necessary to make the best use of a scarce resource in a fair way for all patients, and that rules are developed with input from a lot of people such as transplant professionals, patients, donor family members, and the general public. So why was it necessary to change kidney allocation policy? Change was necessary to create a system that would provide a significant increase in life years for kidney transplant patients. For example, patients who are expected to need a kidney for the longest time will be matched more often with kidneys that are expected to function longer. 
Also, some patients are hard to match with most kidneys because of uncommon blood types or certain immune responses. So, the changes to kidney allocation will boost the chances for these patients to get a matching kidney offer by matching kidneys that are most appropriate to their needs. Another benefit of the changes is that more donated kidneys are expected to be transplanted. However, I do believe that it is important to remember that how a particular patient will be affected by the system depends on their individual clinical circumstances. It's also important to remember that even though there are changes to kidney allocation, if a patient has a willing and compatible living donor, they may still choose living donation as the best option to receive a transplant sooner than waiting for a deceased donor kidney. And kidney pair donation, KPD, is another option for patients with a willing but incompatible living donor. We can discuss these options during your clinic visit. Now, let's introduce each of the characters. Throughout this module, there will be a series of character interactions that will include the following. Doctor, Dr. Paul, Patient 1, Felicia, Patient 2, James, Transplant Coordinator, Linda. There are key components of the new kidney allocation system that patients need to be aware of. Early referral to transplant, waiting time for transplant, the Kidney Donor Profile Index, or KDPI, pediatric patients, estimated post-transplant survival, or EPTS, and priority for highly sensitized patients. Let's take a look at the importance of early referral to transplant. When is the appropriate time to be evaluated for a kidney transplant? The need for kidney patients to be referred early for transplant evaluation is still important and will not change in the new system. It is the goal that every medically suitable patient be referred for evaluation to take advantage of the survival and quality of life benefit that kidney transplantation offers. Often, patients wait too long on dialysis and lose the ability to be considered for a transplant so it's important that they be evaluated early. Patients can even be registered for a transplant before they start dialysis and may qualify for waiting time points based on kidney function tests such as glomerular filtration rate, also known as GFR, or creatinine clearance. So being on dialysis is not the only way to qualify for waiting time points. Let's take a look at the importance of waiting time. How long will a patient wait for a kidney? Waiting time on the kidney transplant list is still a major factor in organ matching for a kidney. A patient's median waiting time is not expected to change significantly, but will differ based on their individual circumstances. Patients who are currently registered for a kidney transplant will not lose waiting time due to the changes in the system. For example, if a patient has spent significant time on dialysis prior to being registered, they will see an increase in waiting time points in the new system. That means they receive a credit for the time spent on dialysis prior to registration. But few currently registered candidates will see large increases in waiting time because 85% of patients currently registered for a kidney transplant have less than three years of pre-transplant dialysis time, and only 7% have more than five years. For adult patients, waiting time points are calculated once the patient is registered on the waiting list and is either on dialysis or has a glomerular filtration rate, also known as GFR, or a creatinine clearance level that is equal to or less than 20 milliliters per minute. For pediatric patients, waiting time points begin immediately at registration. The transplant team can share total waiting time points assigned once the patient is registered for a kidney transplant. Let's take a look at the importance of KDPI. What is the Kidney Donor Profile Index? In the past, kidneys have been identified as a standard or expanded criteria donor kidneys. These classifications will no longer be used in the kidney allocation system. Instead, every donor kidney that is offered for transplant will have a Kidney Donor Profile Index, or KDPI score. So, the KDPI combines certain donor factors into a single number that summarizes the chance that the kidney will fail after transplant. Donor factors included in the KDPI score are age, height, weight, ethnicity, history of high blood pressure, history of diabetes, stroke as cause of death, serum creatinine, a measure of kidney function, exposure to the hepatitis C virus, and whether the donor died due to loss of heart function or loss of brain function. The score ranges from 0 to 100%. 
Lower scores suggest that the kidney will have a longer estimated function time, but higher scores suggest that the kidney will have a shorter estimated function time. Let me review an example for you. If a deceased donor kidney has a KDPI of 0 to 20 percent, the kidney is expected to function, on average, nearly 11 and a half years after transplant. But the majority of donor kidneys have a KDPI score between 21 and 85 percent, and these kidneys are expected to function, on average, for about 9 years. And some kidneys with a KDPI exceeding 85 percent are expected to function, on average, for more than 5 and a half years. If you agree to accept a kidney with a KDPI score greater than 85%, it may increase your opportunities to receive a kidney offer. Since kidneys with a KDPI score greater than 85% have a shorter estimated function time, the transplant team will discuss with you whether or not these kidneys are acceptable based on your individual circumstance. Let's take a look at the importance of pediatric patients. What is the difference for pediatric patients? Patients needing a kidney transplant who are less than the age of 18 will maintain their current level of access to kidneys but will receive priority for donors with a KDPI that is less than 35% instead of donors age 35 as in the current system. This priority will continue to be in place even after the pediatric patient turns 18. It is important to remember that KDPI is not intended to serve as the only donor information in consideration of whether a deceased donor kidney is right for a patient. It can be used as an element in evaluation of the kidney along with other donor characteristics. Also, the actual graft survival for any given kidney also depends on patient-specific factors such as age, diagnosis, HLA mismatching, compliance with treatment protocols, and other factors. The transplant team can help determine the patient's best options. Let's take a look at the estimated post-transplant survival score. What is an estimated post-transplant survival score? Once you are registered on the kidney transplant waiting list, important information about you is entered into the system, and an estimated post-transplant survival score is calculated. The estimated post-transplant survival score, or EPTS score, gives an idea of how long a patient will need a functioning kidney when compared with other patients that are registered for a kidney transplant. The EPTS score is specific to each patient. The factors included in the score are the patient's age, their time spent on dialysis, whether or not there is a current diagnosis of diabetes, and whether the patient has had a prior organ transplant such as a heart, kidney, liver, pancreas, etc. The score is a percentage that ranges from 0 to 100 percent. Every adult patient that is registered for a kidney transplant will receive an EPTS score. An EPTS score may be calculated but will not be used for patients less than 18 years of age. Your score will tell you if you are in one of two EPTS groups. First are patients with an EPTS of 20% or less, and second are patients with an EPTS that is more than 20%. A lower EPTS score means you are expected to have more years of function from the donor kidney compared to patients with higher EPTS scores. Therefore, higher EPTS scores may have less years of function. Let me review a couple of examples. If a patient is in the first group with an EPTS of 20% or less, they are likely to need a kidney longer than 80% of other patients registered for a kidney transplant. This will give them increased priority for kidneys that are expected to function the longest. Patients registered for a kidney transplant prior to starting dialysis will have a higher likelihood of having an EPTS score of 0 to 20%. If a patient is in the second group with an EPTS greater than 20%, let's use the example of an EPTS of 60%. They are likely to need a kidney longer than 40% of other patients that are registered for a kidney transplant. In general, patients with lower EPTS scores tend to be of a younger age, and those with diabetes tend to have higher EPTS scores. Patients who have had a prior organ transplant, as well as those that have spent many years on dialysis, also tend to have higher EPTS scores. The transplant team can calculate a patient's EPTS scores. Let's take a look at the importance of highly sensitized patients. How does the system help sensitized patients get a kidney transplant? Patients with immune sensitivity are harder to match with donor kidneys. Sensitivity is determined by measuring the amount of antibodies found in a candidate's blood that could attack cells in the donated kidney 
and cause rejection of the organ. Highly sensitized patients have more of these antibodies and thus a higher chance of being incompatible with a donated kidney. The likelihood that patients are going to be incompatible with a kidney donor is quantified by giving each patient a CPRA or calculated panel reactive antibody score that ranges from 0 to 100 percent. A CPRA score of 0 percent means the patient has no antibodies considered strong enough to reject a donated kidney. A CPRA score of 99 percent means out of every 100 donors the patient will react to 99 of them. Patients with a high CPRA are more difficult to match than patients with a low CPRA. The system will address these difficulties by awarding additional priority points to those patients with a CPRA score of at least 20%. Let's talk about how this works. Patients with a CPRA of 20 to 29% will receive an additional 0.08 points, which equates to about a month of waiting time. As a patient's CPRA score increases, the amount of the additional points increase. As an example, let's focus on the sensitized patients with high CPRA scores. Patients with a CPRA of 80 to 84 percent will receive an additional 2.5 points, which equates to 2.5 years of waiting time. Patients with a CPRA of 85 to 89 percent will receive just over 4 points, which equates to 4 years of waiting time. But patients with CPRAs in the high 90s will receive substantially more points. Scores of 99 will receive 50 points, and CPR scores of 100 will receive 202 points. Patients with CPR scores of 99 and 100% are extremely hard to match, and no amount of points were found to provide sufficient priority for this group. Because of this, their available pool of deceased donor kidneys will be expanded by giving them first shot to receive offers from donors within their region and on a national level. Because of this increased priority, they may receive offers relatively quickly, even with little or no waiting time. Start with your doctor or the medical team at your transplant center. They will know the most about your specific medical condition and treatment. Call the UNOS Patient Services Line at 888-894 6361 for information about the OPTN and UNOS, allocation policy, and other resources. Additional information can also be found on the following websites, transplantliving.org, optn.transplant.hrsa.gov, unos.org, srtr.org. These are our after transplant expectations. You will be required to have regular follow-up visits with our transplant team here in our clinic. You will be coming twice a week for the first month. That is every Monday and Thursday. How often you come to visits will decrease over time. However, the first six months after transplant are the most critical. We will be closely monitoring your kidney function as well as signs and symptoms of infection and or rejection of the organ. Your transplant team will let you know when you can start coming once a year. Blood work is required for each office visit. The role of the transplant coordinator is to coordinate your care throughout the referral, evaluation, transplant, and the follow-up. You must stay close in contact with your coordinator. Always keep your phone number and address current. Notify your coordinator of any changes. Call your coordinator with any questions. And keep your coordinator updated if you have been sick or in the hospital.
the transplant social worker will help a patient and their family manage a variety of issues associated with transplant. A psychosocial evaluation will include a psychosocial history, identifying your strengths, support system, and other resources, identifying problem areas and provide community resources and referrals if necessary, and identifying who your caregiver and transportation providers will be after a transplant. The purpose of this evaluation is to help determine if a candidate has the psychological stability, motivation, and support system to meet the challenges of a transplant. The use of tobacco, alcohol, and or illicit drugs is carefully examined and patients that meet criteria for alcohol and drug dependence must undergo rehabilitation and demonstrate abstinence before we will list them. It is required that you have a primary support person and you're encouraged to have a backup support person. This main support person must be consistently available throughout the workup process and in the several months following your transplant. That support person can be a family member or a friend. This support person is a critical role in the outcome of a transplant recipient. We offer an optional support group that is available for our transplant patients, their families, and friends. This education and fellowship is very meaningful during all phases of the transplant process. The support group meetings are held every second Wednesday of each month from 5.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. here in our transplant clinic conference room. Contact your social worker for more information. The transplant financial coordinator will help determine a patient's financial eligibility to be listed for transplant. The patient's financial responsibility includes developing a financial plan. The financial coordinator will help you with this task. It's important that you're enrolled in Medicare Parts A, B, and D. Part D is optional if you have a group health plan through your employer. Having a secondary insurance plan in place will help cover the co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance costs. Financial costs for a kidney transplant before transplant will be charged to our program, such as the testing, which includes blood work, chest x-ray, EKG, and echocardiogram. Any needed treatment as a result of the testing will be billed to your insurance company and you would be responsible for the balance. You are responsible for normal health maintenance screening, which is screening for cancer. This includes pap smears, mammograms for women, PSA or prostate specific antigen levels for men, colonoscopies, tuberculosis testing, and vaccinations. Non-medical costs that can include are travel, lodging, meals, lost wages, parking, and child care expenses. The transplant procedure itself can cost more than $200,000 depending upon your length of stay in the hospital. An average length of stay is between 5 to 10 days. Your deductible, coinsurance, and maximum out-of-pocket expenses will be determined by your insurance coverage. Financial costs after a transplant includes the medications which can range from $100 to $5,000 or more per month. All follow-up care and testing is billed to your insurance company. You should also be prepared to return to work before losing your Social Security Disability Insurance and or Medicare. Your financial coordinator will inform you of the financial costs and insurance benefits associated with your transplant.
the transplant dietitian will help ensure patients understand their individualized eating plan and help them make healthy goals. Nutrition after a successful kidney transplant will include the ability to eat foods high in potassium again, such as melons, tomatoes, oranges, bananas, and baked potatoes. You will also likely be able to eat foods high in phosphorus again, such as red beans, milk, ice cream, and peanut butter. To keep your new kidney well hydrated, you will need to take in extra fluids particularly water, and this is crucial in the first several weeks after a transplant. You will also need to watch your weight by monitoring calorie intake. The medications you are required to take after a transplant can cause increased appetite, weight gain, and make diabetes more difficult to control. About 15% of people who receive a transplant develop diabetes even though they never had it before. You must be prepared to learn about insulin and blood sugar testing should this happen. Every patient who is transplanted will be educated about testing their blood sugar in the first week to 10 days after a transplant. If you already have diabetes, you must be prepared to take insulin every day and test your blood sugar two to three times a day. You will need to get and begin using a blood sugar monitor if you do not already have one. You will also need a support person who is willing to learn insulin and blood sugar testing to be able to help you after a transplant. The transplant pharmacist will help educate patients about their medicines. The medicines will include anti-rejection, otherwise known as immunosuppression medicines, and you'll take them for the life of your transplant. You must take these medicines as recommended by the transplant team. Always contact your coordinator before taking any new medication that has not been prescribed by your transplant team. Drug interactions can cause significant increases or decreases in the drug level of your immune suppression in your blood system. Any variation from the therapeutic level can be toxic to your kidney or allow you to start the process of rejection. Make sure you request your medicine refills at least one week in advance before running out of the medicine. Never ever skip your medicines even if you are sick. If the medicines are making you sick, do not stop taking them. Call and speak with your transplant coordinator about your symptoms. This is a sample list of anti-rejection medicine or immunosuppression medicines that you will be taking after transplant. It includes Prograf, Neoral, Myfortic or Celsept, Prednisone, which is steroids, Serolimus or Everolimus. You will not be taking these over-the-counter medicines that includes NSAIDs, which is Aleve or Naproxen, Advil, Motrin, Midol, Nuprin, which are Ad ibuprofen products. This last group are prescription medicines that you will avoid, Indocin, Celebrex, Toradol, and Naproxen. These are some patient resources which include websites that you may obtain additional information. The Transplant Support Group, UNOS, OPTN, Texas Kidney Health, National Kidney Foundation, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Patients, International Transplant Nursing Society, and Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients. This last website will include statistics of all transplant facilities nationwide. You may go and obtain success outcomes for each of those facilities. Now is the time for you to ask questions. Someone will be with you shortly to take your questions. Thank you.